Welcome to WMTV. In this episode, I travel to Norfolk to talk to Dominic Rusgrove. So, are you telling me that your entire career has been based on a lie? Yeah. My problem with it is that they get above their station. Effectively, as long ago as the 80s, we became extensions. Trade press is basically an extension of the, the big companies. The word is cynicism. You need to learn cynicism. Journalists should have a natural uh, inclination to challenge everything. If you take a cast that's been used ten times and is completely tired and has nothing left to offer the spirit, and you mature your whiskey for th three years in a day and it comes out like vodka and then you colour it with caramel and mix it with 90% grain and sell it for six pounds in a corner shop as scotch whisky, that's nothing to do with quality. The trouble with Jim is he doesn't follow through. He puts it out there and then lets people decide that he's done it for whatever reasons and he doesn't get into the debate. Hi Dom. Hello. Thank you very much for having me at your, uh, your house here in, in Norfolk. Pleasure. Um, obviously this part of the world that we're in at the moment is kind of in, in English terms, it's kind of the whiskey capital of, of England, isn't it? Well that's how I like to describe it, yes. Did, did the whiskey bring you to Norfolk or, or did you come here for other reasons? No, no a woman brought me to Norfolk. I, my, my wife uh, is Norfolk born and bred and uh, I met her, oh, she was a, a marketing PR girl and I met her on a press trip. So uh, we were here a long time before there was whiskey, really. Although, um, while I was working away, I was working in London, I got offered a job to take over Whiskey Magazine. The reason I came to do that was because it was back in Norfolk. So, for, for, believe it or not, some people watching this may not know who you are. Right. You, you've been a, a journalist for many years. Yes. And then you became a, a drinks writer. How did you get into journalism in the first place? Um, I always wanted to be a journalist um, from a very young age, I, and I did the classic thing. I was uh, I watched Lou Grant, and uh, the first thing um, when I went for my first interview, they said we get all these people who've seen Lou Grant, and they decide they're going to be uh, journalists. And um, and I was told by my university that it wouldn't happen, so I hitched around the country visiting newspapers and uh, building up my own experience. And um, I eventually got offered a job, and they saw, they said, "Can I see cuttings?" And I hadn't got any cuttings at all, so I spent hours writing fictitious stories and cutting them out. And in the days of cut and paste, you know, you didn't have computers in those days, so um, it's how old I am. Um, but literally, you cut out stories and pasted them onto pages. So I did that, and uh, I think they saw right through it. But I think they saw the, um, the, the, the ability was there and also the ingenuity, if you like. So that's how I did. And I went to work at the Sheffield Star as a, a daily newspaper journalist. So are you telling me that your entire career has been based on a lie? Yeah, but yeah. that's journalism. <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, you know, I, I, people, people often say, uh, uh, you know, about um, you need an English degree. This is my university said, you know, you need an English degree to be a journalist. You don't. Okay. Journalism is a spoken form of uh, writing and it's, um, it breaks every rule. And uh, part of that is uh, telling a good story. I'd like to talk about Jim Murray a little bit later, but mm. I know Jim's a good friend of yours. But yeah. You, you and he are sort of amongst the few whiskey writers that are actually sort of proper dyed in the wool journalists, trained journalists, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, Michael Jackson was too. Right. Jim Murray, myself, and Michael all had, uh, and actually to be fair, Jim and Michael had a more senior uh, newspaper background. I did all mine in the regions, I never went to the nationals. So, how did you get into writing about spirits and, and, and particularly whiskey? It was the recession of 91 92. And uh, the only job I could get uh, was working on a trade newspaper uh, writing about the drinks industry. So I worked for Club Mirror, which was published in Croydon as part of Quantum Publishing. And uh, they had a, a series of drinks titles. So I started writing about the drinks industry. And within that company, I got promoted up into uh, becoming an editor. So I wrote about drinks throughout the 90s. Uh, and then this vacancy came up with Whiskey Magazine and my name was put forward. And of course, I, I lived in this part of the world already. So, um, your interest in whiskey, did that develop sort of on the job or was it something that you, you'd been interested in prior to writing about it? No, I'd like to say I had a, a, a long background in whiskey, but I didn't. Um, my mum and dad both drank whiskey and they used to let me put my finger in it and I guess it was Johnny Walker. I remember the peaty taste and I always liked that peaty taste. It's a, a very comforting thing for me. It was associated with warmth in my house, that's what I remember. 
I could tell you all the market figures. I could tell you what share of the uh, market share whiskey was and scotch was within whiskey and all that sort of thing because that was my job. But I, I didn't taste whiskey and I was just very, very fortunate because uh, I came to Whiskey Magazine and I had two consultant editors, Dave Broom and Michael Jackson. Right. And it doesn't get better than that. And, um, uh, but then, of course, you go to the industry and you know this. You go to the industry and everybody wants to show you what they do and you just you become humbled by it. Yeah. All these people with all this skill and, and, and they know all this stuff that you don't and they want to tell you about it and they want you to, they want you to enjoy it. And what I never, ever thought would happen was that I would fall in love with my job like I did. I, I, I knew I could write about it. I knew I could edit a magazine about whiskey. That was, and I, had, I was group editor, so I had a cigar magazine and a magazine about Scotland. And I, and I knew that as an editor I could do that. But what I didn't know was how much I would fall in love and it would become my passion and my hobby and my way of life. And, and it's, it's just been the most amazing time since because it, it's become all consuming really. In your time writing about whiskey, I mean, uh, and I would say particularly in the, in the last few years, maybe sort of four or five years, there's been an enormous shift because obviously the internet has become uh, very important. Um, things like blogging and social media have obviously given a platform and a voice to a lot of people who previously wouldn't have, uh, have done. Well, you know, what's your view on that? It's not new. I mean, I remember when I went to work in trade magazines and there were people who hadn't done their NCTJ qualifications. They'd come from uh, PR or marketing backgrounds and, and they were, or they, they decided they wanted to be a journalist and so they got a job and they had no training. And I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe you were going to let unskilled people do this job. And that was in the 80s. And it was the growth of the PR departments. Before the 80s, PR didn't, wasn't such a big thing. What happened really was they cut the number of journalists. So gone are the days where you could go out for four days and come back with one great story. You were expected to produce seven or eight stories a day with a smaller number of people. And the people who helped you do that were PR people who gave you the stories. And of course, they only gave you the stories that they wanted you to have. So effectively, as long ago as the 80s, we became extensions. Trade press is basically an extension of the, the big companies because you're writing what they tell you. They give you press releases, it fills the space, you use the picture, job done. So I don't think there's anything different with, with bloggers and, and I have no problem with them per se. I think it's a good thing. I think it's great that uh, young people are coming into whiskey and I think it's great that, uh, that, that there are people with fresh ideas and a different approach. My problem with it is that they get above their station and I, I, it sounds incredibly um, arrogant, but it, I don't mean it to. If you don't put your roots down and if you don't learn uh, the, the fundamentals of journalism and, 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 and the structure of what you're doing, then you, you, you haven't got the values that are necessary. It's, the, the word is cynicism. You need to learn cynicism. Journalists should have a natural uh, inclination to challenge everything and accept nothing. And, and, and so if somebody says this is the way it is, this is a 12-year-old whiskey, the question should be, and we're starting to hear it, what size cask? Because it doesn't mean anything if it's a big cask. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's like having a map reference and only having a latitude, not a long, longitude. You're not really. But they're not, there's not the, I don't see the inquisitive nature. Uh, I don't see enough people uh, starting to challenge the boundaries or to ask difficult questions or try and do anything new. And I think that's fine too. But I just think we have to be honest about what we are. What we are, and I'm included in this, is we're whiskey writers. We're an extension of the PR division. Of We get free samples, we're given a lovely life, we get taken to lovely distilleries, given lovely food and accommodation and lovely whiskey to drink, and then we write nice things about it. That's what we do, pretty much. And that's not journalism. Because to me, the definition of journalism is something, it's something that is said that someone somewhere else doesn't want to be heard. Basically, it can't, you can't be that close to the hand that feeds you if you're going to be a journalist. You can't be pally with, um, uh, with the industry that you're meant to be reflecting if you're a journalist. But that's fine. There's nothing wrong with uh, uh, doing what the bloggers do. I think it's fine. I just have an issue when they see themselves in some sort of exalted journalistic role, because they're not. That's not my profession. It, it, unless you've knocked on the door of a, a, a woman whose son was run over the day before and had to talk to her about her dead son and ask for a photograph, unless you've done that stuff, or been threatened by a council meeting by somebody because you're going to report the fact that a local businessman's going to lose his driving licence. Unless you've done that stuff, then you can't really... Claim. It, there's an apprenticeship. You know, I can change a, a bandage. It doesn't make me a doctor. And I think, that's, I think that's what my issue. So I've got no problem. I think they're a force for good. I just think we have to put them into the context. The reason the industry likes them so much is because they're a soft touch at the end of the day.
they'll, they'll do stuff yeah. for free whiskey. Is that what you're saying? Yes, and I mean we're all guilty of it. I, I, I'm not going to stand. I'm just more honest about it. I, I, I think that Jim Murray. One of the reasons I respect him is because he does stand up for what he believes for whatever reasons, and uh, and he's in a position that he can. His view is that Scotch is in danger of, and I don't agree with him entirely, but his view is that Scotch is in danger of uh, being reinterpreted as an inferior product because we're accepting sulphur as an ingredient in whiskey. That's not how it should be, in Jim's view. Um, those questions are, need to be asked. You, you need to, otherwise you lose, it's like losing, you, you know, your cuticles on your, on your nails. If you don't keep pushing them back and, and put, seeing where the boundary is, it gets eroded. I, oh, sorry, just one other thing. Mm. It makes me absolutely furious that people are paid by companies to write what is meant to be independent journalism. I once, when I was editor at Whiskey Magazine, somebody actually said that they were paid every time they got a reference to a particular distillery into copy that I was paying for independently. I, I mean, and that's what I mean about eroding. You know, it's a fine line between what is actually marketing and PR and, and it's journalism. And I know we're all guilty of it. And I'm not standing up and saying I'm better than anybody else. I'm not. I just think we need to be aware of it. And it's good that somebody, be it me or Jim, challenges it. That's all. Recently, well, I'd say recently, about a year ago, you started an online magazine called World Whiskey Review. And you've become one of the sort of real sort of uh, standard bearers for world whiskey, whiskey made outside the sort of the traditional big four producing countries. Is that a bandwagon you're jumping on or is this something really genuinely new and exciting that is, is upsetting the world of whiskey? Uh, it's definitely new and exciting. Um, uh, we're back to my journalistic thing. What excites me is something that's new. And when I became editor of Whiskey Magazine, I, it's like being the manager of a football team. I had the best Scotch writers and I had uh, writers that could do various parts of the magazine. So my job was to fill the gaps and to do... And at that time, Irish whiskey and bourbon was badly covered in Whiskey Magazine. So I made those my special subjects. And when I went freelance uh, some eight years ago now, uh, I looked around and I thought, where can I get a lead on, on my competitors? I know, I'll get on a plane and I'll get an easy jet flight to Spain, visit a Spanish distillery, they'll put me up in a hotel overnight, so it's just the flight, 30 quid, and I'll sell that story two or three different places. So I started to see an opportunity to do that. What's actually happened is that whiskey's taken off in the way it has, and it's just been an incredibly dynamic time. But I, I also found that what I was finding was that these people are doing things differently to Scotch and Irish, and it's just interesting. And do you think that some of the whiskey that's coming from the other parts of the world, is it genuinely giving the, the, the older whiskey-producing countries a run for its money? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I've got to be careful what I say here. I find it very, very curious that the, 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 the Scotch whiskey industry suffers from this kind of um, almost two opposites, uh, insecurity and arrogance. So on the one hand, it thinks it makes the best whiskey in the world, and it does. And on the other hand, it's not prepared to, it, to acknowledge that there could be other people perhaps doing it. And, and that's, not, that's not entirely true, but that's true to some extent. And what I always say in this conversation, you have to start, proceed your conversation at all these points by saying, Scotch whiskey is the best in the world. And if I have a book with 750 whiskies in it, which I did, 500 of them will be from Scotland, but 250 won't be. And there are great whiskies, not just from uh, Ireland and Japan and Kentucky or, or Canada, but from emerging markets. And, and you know, the results say it all. They, they tasted blind by experts and they, they do well. So, um, yeah, there's definitely lots going on. And not only that, they're, they're, they don't come with baggage. So we'll see more innovation and uh, unusual practices. And, you know, there's an issue there because we're in Europe and we have rules. But outside, the, outside Europe, the, you know, they, they are prepared to try new things and, and, and there's, there's all sorts going on. And that's really exciting. And maybe we'll develop new drinks categories. Maybe it will eventually come within the whiskey family. Who knows? But that's got to be good because every other drinks category is uh, in competition. So whiskey can't stand still. Um, that said... When you're as good as Scotland is, you don't need to change that much because they've taken a thousand years to get it right. You just um, need to maintain standards. That's exactly right, yes. And you hope that the custodians are going to do that. So you wouldn't go as far as, say, Jim Murray is at the moment, where he, I mean, I think in your words, you said to me the other day that he, he's pretty much declared war on Scotland. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, I think, I think I, Jim has a real issue about sulphur. He's quite right that uh, copper is used in the process to take sulphur out and it's a blemish in whiskey. However, what 
where I disagree with him entirely is that he thinks that, uh, that he has statist- statistics that show that a proportion of the population can't taste sulphur, and that's why they get around it. I taste sulphur. I have a very, very acute sense of sulphur, and I actually quite like it when it's, we could call it spent match rather than sulphur, but uh, it, it, it can be a, a, a plus. And uh, I don't think it necessarily makes, you know, that you can't just dismiss it as a, a negative. He has a point. Um, it's funny because Jim and I have had this conversation any number of times. I'm not saying anything I haven't said to Jim. I take issue with him because I, he rang me up about Glenn Drunk at 15 and 18 when they first came out, uh, when uh, Billy Walker put out Revival. He rang me up and he said, have, have you tasted them? I said, yes. And he said, what do you think? I said, they're quite sulfury. Yes, he said, that's absolutely outrageous. They're, it's a flaw. I said, I don't think it is. I think you'll find that they're probably going into Africa and the local market probably tolerates that in whiskey, and it's deliberate. I don't think Billy Walker's made a mistake at all. And um, Jim scored those whiskies quite well in the end, but I take a little bit of issue with him because he's prepared to condemn Scotland for sulphur, but then he'll let an Australian whiskey sit for 35 minutes to let the sulphur evaporate <laughs> and then judge the whiskey without the sulphur. So it, it, there's an inconsistency for me. Um, I think he over dramatizes. I think um, it's great that he's raised an issue that uh, is a talking point. The trouble with Jim is he doesn't follow through. He puts it out there and then lets people decide that he's done it for whatever reasons, and he doesn't get into the debate. And if I'd done that, you know, if I'd taken a view, I would have wanted to defend that view and to talk about it. What he got was lots of headlines about Scotch is going to taste of rotten eggs, Mm. which isn't quite what he said, but that's what the Daily Mail and the likes picked up, and he didn't do anything to put a balance to that. And so I think he, he, he's, he's made his controversy deliberately strong and perhaps it's not as rational as it should be. So you've started an organisation called the CDA, which is to represent craft distillers. What, what, what was your thinking behind that? What started it was uh, a few years ago, John Glaze at Compass Box and I were talking about the fact that when they introduced tax stamps on bottles, the SWA represented all the big companies, but nobody was fighting the corner of a small producer where the cost of putting tax stamps on is significant. You change every bottle run and it, it, it is a, a, a cost and somebody should have at least put that view across. And, and what was happening was America has uh, gone ballistic. I mean, they, they've done what they did with craft brewing. They've got 400 to 500 craft distillers in America now. And there were signs that it might happen here. And there were indications that uh, customs and excise was going to be more liberal in the interpretations of the laws. And I was thinking, how fun. Again, you know, th- this is uh, something uh, that um, would be uh, a stimulus. It would take me into areas like gin and rum and vodka, which I, I wasn't, you know, I don't really do. And um, I just thought it would be fascinating to hear people's stories because the, pe- the people behind, often the people behind uh, those into craft distilling, they've worked in the stock market or, you know, and Brinks Matt or something and, and, and they've had a breakdown because of the pressure of work and have decided to go and live in the country and set up, um, a, 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 and they've got great stories to tell. Um, and the two other things that really fascinated me were when um, St. George's, the Norfolk distillery, first applied for a license. The council officers recommended they go onto an industrial estate in Attleborough. So Andrew Nelstock came to me and he said, could I write to the councillors and explain about tourism and pagodas and rivers and mountains? And so I did. And not only did the councillors overturn the council officer advice, they reprimanded the council officers for not doing their research properly. And St George's is in a rural site, it's not an industrial estate. Lakes Distillery up in Cumbria, eight years or ten years on, is having the same battle. And I thought, this is ridiculous. Why isn't there, why, why, why isn't there joined up writing? You know, Andrew's experience should translate to the Cumbrian Council and they should be able to see that actually it's not a great big factory. It's got a provenance. It's, got, um, it's good for local tourism. It's, uh, it's, you know, it's got a good carbon footprints because you, it's all local. It's tied in with farming. It's about quality over quantity. It's about responsibility, crafting. So I just thought there's a message there and, and it's a good message to get out. So um, all of that came together this year and we, we've launched it. And um, 
it's been interesting because it's not gone as smoothly as uh, as that. It's not it's not suddenly we're you know knights in shining armor and everybody's saying good old Dom and Sally for setting up this organisation and uh, boy is it political. But that's good for me too because it's a challenge and and if you want to do something that's stimulating, it's good to find new areas and craft distilling for me is there's lots and lots of great stories and new areas to learn about. And what's the reaction been? I mean, for example, from the Scotch Whiskey Association, the SWA, um, I mean, they've obviously got a vested interest here. What do they think about what you're doing? Well, we went to see them uh, right at the outset, and um, they told us three things. They told us that you couldn't uh, distill under 1,800 hectolitres of whatever the measurement is, and that's just not true. Uh, but nobody ever challenged it. It's never been challenged that, but actually the law doesn't say that at all. And they told me that um, if uh, we started messing around with a three-year rule, uh, the minimum maturation period for whiskey, uh, they'd bring lawyers in and get very heavy with us. And they would take a very negative view if we started to campaign on behalf of small distillers for tax breaks, uh, because that's what happened to brewers. Uh, brewers uh, small brewers get uh, favourable tax breaks that uh, big ones don't. That's not going to happen because nobody in their right minds in this day and age is going to look at cutting tax when we're in the mess we're in, and nobody's going to champion alcohol as a thing to cut tax for, so it's not going to happen. But we walked out of that meeting and John Glazer said to me, Dominic, don't be bullied by them because actually it might be your responsibility to fight that battle, and that's exactly right. We're, not, we're, not, we're nothing to them, but it, you know, we're, we're so small and so insignificant. We represent pretty, there's no crossover with membership. Uh, we, we represent um, people non-Scottish, pretty much, and a lot of them are non-whisky. So it's, there's, there's not really, I don't think one of our members, um, I'm trying to think, John Glazer might be arguably a target for the SWA, but there's not much. And we're not making noises and we're not taking them on on anything and we're not challenging them and we respect them. I totally respect the SWA, more so than most. When I wrote an article for Whiskey Magazine on the SWA, I got more negative criticism about that article than any I've written on whiskey. Uh, they're not liked. Because you defended them? Or yeah, you, you... I, wrote, I wrote and showed the, the positive side of what they do and the force for good. Because actually, you only hear about the SWA when they're smashing some poor distillery in Canada uh, over the head for daring to sound like they might be Scottish. Yeah. Or at budget time where they make a statement about duty mm -hmm. or you know and that's about all you hear but actually what they do is very very important there's lots and lots they i went up to their edinburgh headquarters and they've you know they've got a thriving uh, department of lawyers and and people watching and monitoring and defending scotch and the defending scotch is great it's the negative side of pushing down opposition or, uh, or, or suppressing people who are doing nothing really wrong. I mean, Matt Myra is a classic example. They, um, they had a problem with the name Matt Myra. It's a Swedish word, but it's got Mac in it. So they said, you've got to put the word Swedish whiskey on the label. And uh, I was talking to Lars Lindenberger at uh, Matt Myra. He said, funny enough, we wanted to. You know, there's an arrogance that, to suggest that Swedish whiskey would try and pass it off as Scotch. They don't want to be Scotch. They want to be Swedish whiskey. So I, I think that uh, the SWA's misunderstood to an extent but it doesn't do itself a lot of favours um, and I also think they can bully mm. and, and I, I, I'm not bothered by them, I'm not scared of that and if we do have to pick a fight with them then we will because you know, that, that would be my job, I mean that's, it would be wrong not to and there will be issues I'm sure where that will happen. If you look at what goes on in Europe and you look at the, you know, the appellation contrôlée, say, and you know, no one would argue that they don't do a great job protecting a type of cheese or what Bordeaux is, you know, mm. and, and, and we all want those products prote protected and we want scotch protected. Most of us enjoy the tradition of that. The, 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 the issue that's going to raise its head eventually is that until 10 years ago, there was Scotland with 100 distilleries. And then there was smattering of distilleries in Japan, Ireland, Kentucky, and Canada. And that was it. And Scotland dominated that, that bulk. And those other countries are willing, on Kentucky, I mean, bourbon, but people always get this wrong, but bourbon can be made in one minute. You only have to mature it for one minute and it's bourbon. Uh, they have a definition of straight bourbon, that two years old. But, uh, so American whiskey could be sold at, at a very young age. But they respect Scots, so they don't send uh, under. They don't try and send underage bourbon under three years old to Europe because they respect Scotland, and that's the way it's been. But this new wave of distillers, they're not bound by those rules. They're kind of punks on the block, if you like. They, they, this is a you know this is a new wave of new thinking, and a lot of them 
aren't prepared to just accept those rules as they are. And the, the, the truth of the matter is, there's a lot of them. There's maybe seven, eight, a thousand distilleries outside the traditional areas, a lot more than Scotland's got. So sometime down the line, that's going to be a powerful lobby. Now, at the moment, the American uh, industry is split. It's, uh, the craft is still, they're, they're, they're infighting. There's all sorts of splintering going on and all sorts of politics. And this is what I've stumbled into. But there is a really interesting debate going on about whether you should define American whiskey as separate to Scotch. And if so, it should be bound by the rules that dictate American whiskey and it should be recognised in Europe. That would mean whiskey under three years old coming to Europe. And I'm, our, our association is being told to take a start, or being asked to take a stance and to get into a. I'm willing to host the debate and I'm willing to ask my members what they think and I'm willing to raise the issues as a journalist. I personally don't want to see the three-year-old change, for, not for the reasons you might imagine. I'll, I can explain that, but I, I think we would get distracted on something that would come to, to be honest, doesn't, it make, it, it's neither here nor there. Because presumably the three-year rule for Scottish whisky exists because this whisky is matured in a colder climate. Basically, it's to protect the consumer. That whisky that's matured under three years, by and large, isn't going to be that good. So, surely that's the thinking behind that rule. Does that apply to whisky that's matured in America or well, in India? There's a well, there's a, there's a real irony in this straight away. It's like going to the fun fair and they've got a, a barrier for what size children could go on it, and it's so low that every child's above it anyway. You don't see many three-year-old whiskies. Uh, single, certainly single malts you don't, and for, or even five or seven, because they're not very nice. The truth of the matter is it's not a standard control thing because three-year-old scotch isn't that great. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. I also have got a real issue. My big issue is if you take a cask that's been used 10 times and is completely tired and has nothing left to offer the spirit and you mature your whiskey for th three years and a day and it comes out like vodka, and then you colour it with caramel and mix it with 90% grain and sell it for six pounds in a corner shop as Scotch whisky. That's nothing to do with quality. So I don't accept the argument about quality at all. That what's making the issue so exciting and interesting, though, is that Cavalan, Amaret, uh, some American distilleries are proving, you know, I mean, Texas is the climate's totally different. We're not just talking about temperature, we're talking about extremes of temperature, we're talking about barrel size, type of barrel, type of wood used. Uh, humidity, all of these things. In Australia, in Tasmania, if there's going to be a storm, the casks start to leak. And they start to leak because the pressure's obviously affecting the liquid. So it's got to have an effect. So all these questions are now being raised. And the truth is that it takes 10 to 12 years to make a premium scotch. And it's hard for them to accept that India might do it in three years. And not only is it hard to accept, it's potentially very damaging them to accept because it means that they have, that India and uh, Taiwan have an economic advantage because they can take whiskey to market in far less time. Um, but that's the reality. No, nobody would argue. I, I would put my professional reputation on the line and say that Amrit's a great whiskey. Uh, and I have done many, many times. It's won, the awards it's won across the world because it's great whiskey and it's, it's very young. So there are issues there. Um, it's the Americans that are really fascinating, though, because the Australians basically want a minimum standard because they want to be taken seriously. So they sort of ask their government to maintain a minimum standard as a sign that they're serious about their whiskey and they want to be seen as a serious. But uh, a lot of the Americans are looking at flavour. And the irony of this, of course, is that Scotland, in its need to now uh, meet uh, the demands of the world, as looking at unaged whiskies and selling whiskies younger and putting them in quarter casks and actually is moving back and saying, well, the, the, the woods are better quality than it used to be, so now we can put stuff out at seven years old because we're better wood management and we've got, you know, we, we've raised the standards. So there's an irony that the two, you know, not a million miles apart, but mm. they are apart. So obviously we're coming to the end of 2012. It's been a big year for you. What does 2013 hold for Dominic Rosgro? Um, I think probably more of the same, really. Um, there's lots of work to be done with the CDA, and uh, we've got to start to uh, decide what we want to be and how we're going to do it. Um, I'd like to think the Wizards would expand next year. They did very well this year, but I'd like to take them forward. Uh, we're going to do the Whiskey Shop magazine online monthly, so I'll be doing that. And I've got a very um, optimistic view of what's happening with Whiskey Advocates. Um, the new ownership, Marvin Schenken, who owns Cigar Aficionado, has got uh, very ambitious plans and uh, he's made it very clear 
that uh, he um, expects us to be part of his team and to work with him. So hopefully that will continue. And if I'm lucky, um, I'm hoping to get one or perhaps two book projects that are being discussed at the moment. So same as this year, really, but just, just going forward and taking it on and uh, enjoying the whiskey. No, no rest for the wicked, then? No, 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 absolutely not. Well, I'd like to wish you and your family a, a wonderful festive season and, and Christmas, and I hope that, that passes peacefully and joyously for you and pl plenty of whiskey. And uh, let's catch up next year and, and see how the projects are carrying on. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. I appreciate it. Cheers, thank you. See you soon.